to keep coming. And if you keep, if you keep showing up, we're going to, we're going to be here. So we're planning this thing. We've already planned it out towards September and the working group is doing a great job. A couple, several of them have, are rolling off the medical school and we've um, buffed up the uh, working group. So we're here, we're here for you. And we just want to tell you how very much we enjoy it. One last point. As many of you know, I'm on the admissions committee of UT Southwestern Medical Center Medical School. And we're looking forward in the next few months to see how much attention admissions committees are going to pay to virtual shadowing hours. Admissions committees, not just the medical schools, but of PA schools, nursing schools, nursing practitioner schools, and so forth. We will keep you posted on that. We will be a direct conduit as to what we're finding out. We welcome one of our guests this evening, Ruth Ann Murphy from one of our colleges here in Texas. And she works with the Health Professions Advisory Committee. She's uh, a, a doctorate and teaches chemistry there. So we welcome our guests this evening. Uh, Taylor, would you now introduce our esteemed guest from Harvard this evening? Yes, of course. So that being said, I just wanted to introduce our super special guest, Dr. Amr Nassar. So take it away. Hey guys, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm very happy to be able to share my story with you and talk to you a little bit about general surgery. I'll start by talking a little bit about my background. It is a little bit uh, different than most uh, of the graduates you'll find in the U.S. Uh, that's because I'm not from the U.S. and I'm not an American graduate uh, in terms of my medical education. So I'm, I'm Amr. Uh, I was actually born in Jerusalem. I'm Palestinian origin. And I grew up there for 16 years and then decided to go to medical school in Europe. And I went from this beautiful city on the left to this beautiful city on the right uh, to the University of Szeged in Hungary. And for, for us, um, most countries outside the U.S., medical school, as many of you will know, is straight out of high school. It's a total of six years, and that gets you to bypass sort of the uh, pre-med or, or undergrad route. But it is a couple of years long in terms of medical school. After that, I ended up going to New York, where I did a couple of years of research. Um, and that was sort of a little transition period for me. It was a little period outside of clinical medicine. Uh, worked for a private research group and was able to do a couple of things, build up my CV in order to apply for residencies in the U.S. Um, as uh, some of you will know, it's uh, quite competitive for uh, surgical residencies in the U.S. And especially for an inter if you're an international medical graduate, you really want to be able to present uh, yourself as best you can and put your best foot forward. And, you know, research is a great way to do that. I had an amazing opportunity in New York and I, I took a full flight of that. And from there, I jumped from this beautiful city in the US, New York, to uh, this, what you see on the right here, which is um, uh, in Seattle. And this is actually taken on, on the helipad of Harborview Medical Center, which uh, some of you might know is one of the most esteemed uh, trauma centers in the US, one of the largest medical centers uh, for a, a level one trauma center and uh, largest catchment area per square kilometers in the U.S. And this was uh, actually- Hammer, you know, uh, Seattle is one of the original EMS systems. Uh, EMS, which is my gig, uh, really began in America back in the 60s. And there were six cities that stood forward, uh, Seattle, Miami, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Los Angeles among them. And Seattle was one of the first original organized uh, pre-hospital trauma systems uh, in the nation, meaning in the world. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've definitely heard that story. And, and I think Seattle is very, very proud of that history um, with their amazing EMS system. Um, and that still translates to today. We see a lot of patients who come to our, who I should say, who came to our trauma center when I was back there, uh, who were, you know, worked up very well. A lot of them were intubated. Some of them were even cracked in the field. Uh, we, can, we can get into those details later, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of, of the EMS uh, uh, system in, in Seattle. Um, and then from there, I jumped uh, a few uh, years later to, this is um, a picture I took a few days ago, walking to work. This is Harvard Medical School on my way to the campus in Longwood Medical Center at Boston Children's, uh, where I spend um, about six months uh, of my time the next few years training in plastic and reconstructive surgery. So what does it take to become uh, a doctor? What does it take to become a surgeon? And uh, 
what's what's sort of the path? Um, as I said, you know, six years of medical school for anyone who's coming from outside the U.S., uh, four years of undergrad and four years of medical school from anyone who's in the U.S. Uh, the last year of medical school in the U.S., uh, you'll mainly focus on completing sub eyes. Those are called sub internships. For me, they were called clerkships, and that's an opportunity I got to travel around the world and complete different uh, uh, rotations at different hospitals and different fields. I got lucky enough to go to London where I did my ob rotation. I went to Seoul at As in Asan Medical Center. I did my cardiothoracic rotation. I came to Boston where I was at Harvard and I did my cardiology rotation. I did my PEDS GI rotation in New York and my pulmonology rotation at Providence at Brown. Uh, last year of medical school, obviously there's a thesis defense that we have to do. Uh, which is what, how you get your doctorate uh, name and you get to call yourself a doctor. After that, uh, that's just the beginning of the road, unfortunately. <laughs> then there's quite a few other steps you'll have to, uh, hoops you have to jump through to make your way to the US. These are the hoops I had to jump through. It's the same hoops that every American graduate has to jump through. It's completing these four major exams. There are actually three steps, but they're split up into four exams. The US Assembly step one, test your basic knowledge in medicine, biochemistry, anatomy, et cetera. Uh, USMLE assembly step two tests uh, your clinical knowledge in talking to patients and taking uh, physical uh, uh, exams. Step two CK is a little bit more clinical knowledge and step three is even more in-depth clinical knowledge. And all these exams are sort of mandatory to, in order to get into training into the US and become a doctor. A few things you have to hey, sort of- Hey, Amr, there was a question just asked. I, I'm a, forgive me for interrupting. It says, does every medical school require a thesis defense at the end of the fourth year? Could you follow on to that? Because you explained that that was from overseas. Could you explain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'll, 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 I might actually defer to you regarding the US, but internationally it varies country by country. Um, a lot of countries will require a thesis in order to uh, graduate. Some countries like Germany don't actually require you to complete a thesis for graduation, but they do require you to complete a thesis if you wanna call yourself a doctor. Um, and so if you wanna get the doctor title in countries like Germany, for example, you have to have a thesis completed and defended. And that doesn't have to be done in medical school. Actually, a lot of German physicians will complete their theses post-graduation, sometimes up to years after they graduate. But in Hungary and a few other medical schools, uh, sorry, uh, countries around Europe and a few other countries around the world, then a thesis is uh, a mandatory mandatory step to, to, to get your diploma. What was your thesis on, um, Amr? My thesis was actually uh, in psychiatry. Um, I was really interested in, back, back when I was in medical school, uh, in neurology and psychiatry, and I completed my thesis uh, on the differences in delirium um, uh, compared to uh, uh, um, psychosis. That, that's fascinating, especially in this era of excited delirium in the field that we deal with so much. As a matter of fact, we're excited delirium is so bad for us in the pre-hospital sector that we're actually putting out a new course called Advanced Mental Health Life Support, which we will do on um, Monday. It's a four-hour program. It's We're rolling it out. And, you know, think new card course, you know, the world needs a new card course, right? But yeah. um, uh, it, to deal specifically with the issue of excited delirium, for example, Come on, people, don't do prone positioning and put a knee in somebody's back. You will kill them, you know, and so on and so on. Yeah. Anyway, that's great. I think that's cool. certainly gotten a lot of attention over the past year after the recent uh, events um, in the news. Uh, and so that's sort of, you know, medical school and examinations. And then there's all the, let's call them sort of extracurricular activities, which are, you know, part of your education, part of your career development and your professional growing and that's research projects and publications. And uh, I, I have about 15 publications. I've also co-edited a, a book. Um, and those are just some of the things that I've done throughout my career in order to you know, get where I am today. So applying to residency. Now you've finished medical school, uh, you've done all the steps and everything, you know, you've, you've buffed up your CV with a lot of research, a lot of interesting stuff you've worked on. How do you start training? Well, this is where applying to residency comes in. This is what I had to go through, what every American graduate has to go through. First, you have to decide what you want to do and decide what your passion is. Hopefully that's something you're 
working on for several years and building it up at, as you go along. And then you apply via the match. And the most important step is you pray that you get uh, into the field that you want to get into, into the place you want to get into. And my dreams came true. I hey, to- hey, Amr, let me take that point for a moment. We started that way back in the first session, second and third session saying, if you're really thinking about medical school, it is a long, long way. And then you just made that important point that, you know, the, the chance you're taking about getting into the program that you want. You had what, 15 publications? Is that what you said? Um, yeah. About, to, be able to, to be able to be accepted to a first rate number one program in the world. So you've obviously been on the front line and working your tail off for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, medicine people um, have the common misconception that it's a career or a profession. I sort of disagree with that. I think, I think medicine is a lifestyle. I think you're adopting uh, a persona and that has to be part of who you are. And it's sort of uh, day in and day out. You, 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 you become a doctor, you become a physician and you never get to take that hat off. I think it's something that uh, you have to be proud of and something that you're will, you have to be willing to put in the hard work and sort of dedicate your life to this profession we call medicine. Um, and after is all that, that you're been, saying is that, is that, is that you become a doctor? It's, you're not the same person that you were to some degree, you become a doctor. I think so. I think so. You know, I, it might just be uh, life and, and sort of natural progression of growth. But I think, I think medicine changes, uh, changes somewhat over time. I think after, you know, years of, of completely uh, uh, delving into one field and studying the human body and taking care of patients and having uh, to show empathy and, uh, and, and uh, show care for patients on a day in day out basis, regardless of how tired you are and, how demotivated you are or what else you have going on in your life, like weddings or birthdays. I think all that comes secondhand and all that takes a back seat. unfortunately. Um, it's just a part of, uh, uh, I think it's just a part of medicine. And I think that ultimately changes someone. I think um, most people I know in medicine have changed for the better and they've sort of really adopted this persona of becoming a healer. Um, and that comes with a lot of sacrifices. And I think those sacrifices build the persona that who we are as doctors. I love that, Amr. I, I love the way you put that. I, you know, you think when you were a kid and you were sick and your folks took you to the doctor and you see the doctor and that is the doctor. He, he, it's, a, it's a very special persona. And yet you mentioned the stresses, you're tired, your feet are killing you, you got to pee, you're hungry, you're hypoglycemic. And, you know, you're a human, but at the same time, you can't let up. I've got to go to work at seven in the morning at Parkland tomorrow, and we're going to be full. We're going to be boarding 50 for admissions in the ER out of 110 beds. We're going to be packed people in the hallways. But you have to be committed to getting the right answer every single time. You can't let up. I'm sorry to be so dogmatic, but I, I just feel very strongly about that. No, I, Go ahead, please, I completely please. agree with you. No, I, I think I completely agree with you. And, and, and I love that you mentioned that. I, I, even So I'm actually post-call today. But for those who don't know what that is, that means uh, I took call all night yesterday and, uh, and all day yesterday. And, and, you know, even after doing this for, you know, for nine plus years, I got called in at, at you know, late, late hours of the night, early hours of the morning to Boston Children's because a kid had some pretty bad trauma to the face. And no one wants to go into work at one, two, three in the morning. No one wants to go to work, but you have to, you have to get up and you have to go and do it. And not only that, when, when you get there, the only thing that matters for that child and for the family is that you are there 100% and you are on your best game. And I think that ultimately defines what medicine and what surgery uh, are. It's that you have to be there for your patient all the time, when it, well, at, at, essentially at any time of the day. And I think it takes someone like that to be able to become successful and become a good physician and take care of good patients in medicine. Hey, Amr, um, oh, Amr, sorry. How many residents, we had, we had a question pop up. How many residencies did you apply to? Uh, so for, for general surgery, I think I applied to uh, 25 or 30. I can't quite remember, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been a few years. Wow. 
<laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and I, and some, some people will tell you you should apply for more. And then I think I interviewed at maybe 15. And then for fellowships, uh, similarly, I think I applied even more. I think I applied to 39 fellowships. There are 42 total, I applied to 39. And I only interviewed at uh, 10 or 11. Um, and I, and I, how much out of pocket money? How much out of pocket money did you spend for your uh, interviews? Oh gosh, uh, you, uh, I, I actually calculated it because say, I submitted it. Let's say two or three thousand per because you had to travel. You know, if you include airfare and hotel, maybe not quite that much. Fifteen hundred times thirty was that forty five thousand dollars you spent applying to residency, something like that? Yeah, I think the applications themselves were probably about five to $6,000. And then, then I only interviewed at 15 places. And I think um, I got lucky in terms of hotels. Uh, I knew a lot of people on the track. So we'd like team up with rooms and stuff. I think, I can't remember how much I spent for residency, but for fellowship just a few last year, um, I had spent, I think, eight or eight to $10,000. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because people who are applying these days, it's completely free. I mean, they're, they're buying a good camera because all of all the interviews, as you know, I mean, you're on the admissions board and uh, I, I don't know if it's, it's going to be like this also for residency this year, but for last year, it was all we, virtual. We will, do virtu we will do virtual again this year. We'll do virtual. So, you know, I, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I guess the pros are you get to save a lot of money and get to interview at more places. The, the cons are you don't get to meet the program in person. You don't get to meet the residents there in person. You don't get the, you know, the feel of the place. We're actually publishing a paper on this and a few, uh, uh, if it's, it's been accepted for revision uh, or pending revision uh, at the Plastic Reconstructive Surgery Journal about plastic surgery uh, virtual interviews. So keep an eye on that. But I think it's a very interesting time uh, for any, anyone who's applying to residency and fellowships. I've, I've interrupted you far too much. I'm so sorry. I'm just thoroughly enjoying what you're saying. Please go ahead. Not at all. Thank, thanks for the questions. So, you know, th this, this was probably one of the happiest days I've had in the past decade after a lot of work. Um, those of you who are international medical graduates will know it's, it's, uh, it's always lurking in the back of your mind. Will I match in the U.S.? W will I go through all this hard work, do all these USMLEs, do all this research, pay all this money for um, for, uh, applications and interviews. And then am I going to match? And this, this was an absolutely very happy day for me matching at the university of Washington it was my number one program. Uh, and then, you know, after all that sort of, you're still back at square one starting surgical residency and scratching my head, asking myself, well, what is surgical residency and how do I get through these next five years? Um, I did two years of research. I did five years of general surgery. Um, what is general surgery? Well, general surgery, people think it's sort of general as a term applies, but it really is a specialty in its own. And as every other specialty, it has subspecialties within it. Those subspecialties, a lot of them now have fellowships. Most of them have fellowships, especially if you're thinking of working in a um, academic center or in a big city, then you probably are going to be uh, fellowship trained. But if you're thinking of going and working in a community center or a more rural area, then general surgery really prepares you to take care of this entire, you know, list of patients over here, which is acute care surgery, endocrine surgery, uh, colorectal, hepatic biliary, which takes care of liver, gallbladder, and pancreas disease. Uh, sorry, this keeps jumping back foregut surgery, which is the stomach and the esophagus, trauma surgery, burn surgery, transplant surgery, pediatric, and then certain other subspecialties, which have now sort of broken away from general surgery, but are somewhat still very much intertwined, cardiothoracic, vascular, and plastic surgery. And these are all the things I had to learn over the past five years in order to become a board certified general surgeon. You really have to um, uh, become very comfortable in both the knowledge as well as the technical aspects of doing all of these subspecialties. A day in life of a surgical intern. I remember my first, I remember my first day on surgery. I remember rounding my first day on surgery and not knowing anything. Um, I actually remember uh, I didn't know how to put orders in. And I just thought to myself that morning when I was supposed to put in orders on 30 patients, I was like, if I just, you know, have someone else put in the orders, I might be able to get in through internship without putting any orders at all. And I'll just like pretend like I can't put in orders. 
that lasted about two minutes before I realized no one else is going to do it except me. Um, and then I realized the most important thing for a good surgical intern or a good intern of any specialty is problem solving and adaptation. And if you sort of approach any problem in medicine as this is a problem, I'm going to find a solution. Not I, you know, I want someone to help me find a solution, but I'm going to find a solution. You will find a solution. And I think that is sort of one key thing that I'd like to pass on to everyone is that if, 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 you, if you encounter a problem, find a solution, do all the work it takes to find a solution, and then that's how you progress. And you actually learn so much more that way than asking other people for help, um, which you shouldn't be ashamed of, always ask for help, but try to find a solution on your own first. So this is a day of a surgical intern. You wake up at 3.30 in the morning, you pre-round on all your patients, meaning you check up on them. Now uh, that means electronic records, looking at charts, looking at their vitals, looking at their labs, looking at the nursing notes, looking at the PT notes, OT notes, medicine consult notes, what their urine output was, how much they ate, what their drain outputs were, looking at all that information, gathering it, writing it down, and then you start rounding on the patients with a team. Usually rounds start around 5.30, 6 o'clock, depending on how many patients you have. And after rounds, you sort of communicate those plans. Uh, usually the chief of the service will do this. They'll communicate the plans with attending, uh, which is sort of, you know, a board certified uh, surgeon, or if it's not surgery, it's another field faculty member. Then the day really begins at seven o'clock in the morning, you start operating. And that means going, checking in the patient, taking them back to the operating room, doing your operations. Usually it's multiple operations a day, unless you have one or two really large operations. And then after you're done, usually it's between, you know, I put 5 p.m. There's no hard stop. Sur surgery, as many of you know, is not shift work. So whenever the surgery is done, you go home. Um, but before you go home, there's a few things you have to take care of, like rounding on all your patients again, making sure all the patients you saw in the morning are now doing okay. And if there's any loose ends, then you got to take care of loose ends. And this here, I mean, I cannot stress enough how much you have to put this thing here in quotations, because... There is no such thing as a standard day for a surgery intern. A lot of times you're running in and out of the OR, you're taking care of patients, you're putting out fires during the day. Some patients crashing on the floor needs to go to the ICU. Some patient in post-op needs to go back to the operating room because they're bleeding. And it really is just problem solving, putting out fires and trying to keep everyone alive. That is sort of the goal of a surgery intern. And it is a very, very humbling job. Um, this is another thing here I put in quotations, finishing at 5 p.m. because as I quickly learned, surgeries don't have a, a determined end time. You finish the surgery whenever you've done the surgery. Uh, the longest surgery that I, uh, I was involved in um, was a 23 hour operation. Um, we started at 7.30, 8 in the morning and we finished at around six in the morning the next day and it went straight to rounds after that. Um, you know, usually you're done around this time though, you go home about seven or 8 p.m. and then the work's not done there. Unfortunately, you got to prepare for cases in clinic the next day. Sometimes you have a full day of clinic. You got to look up all those patients. You got to see who they are. Or if you got more operations the next day, you got to figure out what you're doing. You got to read about those operations. You got to study the anatomy all over again because you tend to forget it. You got to study the techniques, the steps of the surgery, and then you got to make sure that everything's taken care of. Get to sleep, sleep as much as you can, and then you repeat this. Usually, you're working about six days a week if you're if you're in surgery. Um, that's either six days on, one day off, or it's 12 days on, two days off. Um, but this is the average. You only get an average of four days off a month for the entire year. And that usually stretches out for the entire five years of general surgery, not just for the first year. Graduate autonomy is a very uh, well-known term we use in surgery. It's about um, essentially the more you do the higher up you get in surgery, the more you're going to be able to do on your own. And that's just about, you know, patient safety first and foremost, but also how comfortable are you doing things? How comfortable is your attending letting you do things? And, and uh, it truly is starting off with smaller, less complex cases, and then finishing off with very complex cases that take 10 to 12 hours, like Whipple's or hepatic transplants or things like that. Let's talk a little bit about a, you know, a few different parts of general surgery. Obviously we can't talk about all the subspecialties, I'd love to, 
Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions after all of this, if anyone's particularly interested in hearing about a subspecialty, but I'll just show, chose three of the most you know, common subspecialties and talk, talk a little bit about them. So acute care surgery, what is acute care surgery? It's really taking care of acute patients. It's taking care of patients who have urgent issues for the most part. Usually it involves abdominal cavity, but not always. And these are sort of very common acute care surgery um, problems, hernias, ulcers, diverticulitis, perforations of the intestines, and infections of various parts of the body. Occasionally, this is life or death, and you have about hours to figure out the problem and find a solution. A lot of times the solution, if it's life or death, is an operation. So you really don't have that much time. Once you get the call, you got to sort of jump at it. You're, you're a lot of times the first one there assessing the patient from the surgical team. A lot of times the emergency department has done an amazing job of working up these patients for you. And they have uh, a general idea of what the problem is. A lot of times they actually can do the hand you the diagnosis because imaging has become so um, easy to use and advanced that imaging sort of confirms the diagnosis. A lot of times, you know, the diagnosis hasn't been made yet. And it's, it's kind of intimidating, I would say, initially uh, to, you know, approach these patients who are in the emergency room um, and they're really in extremis. They're sort of, you know, just teetering that very fine line before they physiologically collapse. Um, and this is a very, uh, very urgent thing they have to deal, of, uh, deal with a lot of times. And you have to come up with a problem. Uh, you have to come up with a solution and find the diagnosis. Q and A. All right. So we've kind of reached. Uh, I guess before you go into the cases, we wanted to answer some questions. So, how in the world do you manage to prevent burnout and exhaustion, and just like keep yourself mentally sharp with such an insane schedule? I think that's a great question. There's been a lot, a lot of talk about burnout and exhaustion in medicine, uh, specifically in the surgical subspecialties, because it really is relentless. Um, and there's been a lot of advancements over the years. Uh, before, um, I want to say before the early 2000s, there were no hour restrictions, meaning you could, you know, work 120, 130 hours, which means you were in the hospital for every day. That's why they called it a residency. You really resided in the hospital. Um, but nowadays, the ACGME, which is American Commission of Graduate Medical Education, has restricted work hours to about 80 hours a week, plus or minus, right? That's an average over four weeks. That's very critical to note because some weeks you can work in 100 hours, uh, which if you divide that up, that's a lot of hours every day. Um, I think it's very, very important to realize the importance of self-care, of mental health, of uh, incorporating different aspects of, uh, of life into your daily routine. Otherwise, like you mentioned, um, uh, you're gonna burn out. And I, there's a lot of more, there's been a lot of talk about this recently because I think people are becoming a little bit more aware and even hyper aware of the importance of uh, preventing burnout, but also the importance of sleep and the adverse effects that sleep deprivation has uh, both on the mind as well as the body, short and long-term. For me personally, um, I, I think I've always been a very high energy person. I think that worked in my favor that probably biased me to go into surgery because a lot of people in surgery are very high energy and somehow, um, you know, have, have, have a lot of energy. Um, uh, I, I would do a lot of sports and a lot of exercise. And I actually uh, paradoxically found that the more I exercise, the less tired I was the next day, <laughs> even though I was sort of, you know, expending energy. And I, I don't know what the, you know, the mechanism of that is. My, my, my theory is that it just sort of increases your threshold for exhaustion. Um, not that that's the way we should be approaching it. I think we should be, you know, trying to get less exhausted, but that's, that's sort of the way I, I approached it. I think having friends and family is so important. Having a support system with your co-residents, co-fellows, you know, knowing the nurses, knowing your PAs, knowing the entire team and being friendly with everyone is probably the most important thing. What I've realized is it's so much easier to go to work when you're working with friends and you're actually going and sort of, you know, uh, enjoying your day-to-day -day interactions than it is 
if it, you're, you're just, you think of it as a job and you just want to get out of there because then it, it really does become exhausting both mentally and physically. Well, well you know, Amber, that's, that's so true. You know, I, uh, I'll be 69 in November. I've been working 44 years. My retirement's paid in. I'm on social security. I could quit now, but what would I do for one thing? I would go home, forget medicine and get stupid. But then what you said, I'm working with the best friends of my life. Why in the world would I not want to be around my best friends that I love working with? You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I've, I definitely felt that a lot last year when I graduated from general surgery and had to leave these, my colleagues. I mean, we were soldiers together. You know, we were in the trenches working, you know, 36-hour shifts, doing 12 to 24-hour operations, rounding on 60 patients, just being exhausted, uh, crying together, having fun together. And all of a sudden, I had, to, I had to leave these guys and I had to move across the country. And we all left and went somewhere else for our fellowships. But it, it's like you said, these, these people become your friends and family. And it's very hard to leave them. So I got a question. What do you do during a long surgery when you have to pee? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny, actually. Um, a lot of, you know, I, I realized I, that's, this is really not good, but I, I actually only pee twice a day. I pee when I wake up and I pee before I go to sleep. And that's not a sign of anything except dehydration um, and chronic dehydration is not good, but that's because I don't drink any water. So I, I don't really, I realize I have to pee. I also don't drink caffeine. Caffeine's a diuretic, so I don't have to pee. But if, if I did, I would just unscrub. I would tell the team, look guys, I need a break. You unscrub, you go, you do your thing and you come back. But um, that's a good point because it, it really stresses uh, what surgery, once you're scrubbed in, and if it's two or three, five in the morning, it doesn't matter. You're so hyper-focused on your task and the adrenaline is rushing so much that you sort of forget everything around you. You forget about your body. And then, and then, and then you get into bed late at night and you're like, oh my God, everything hurts. I'm so tired. I'm so hungry. My neck hurts. My feet hurt. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the bad side of surgery. That's the part where we sort of abuse our bodies a little bit. And there's actually been a lot of work now on, on, on the ergonomics of surgery. I'm really happy that you guys actually have a session in a few weeks about robotic surgery. Robotic surgery, I think, is going to revolutionize the ergonomics of surgery. Um, a lot of surgeons, uh, as you know, um, are, are retiring early because of cervical um, issues. You're staying like this all day in a very, very bad position, um, you know, trying to look under things and you're just, your neck is never in a good place. Your back's never going to be in a good place. And and a lot, of, a lot of surgeons retire early. I think the advancements in robotics and laparoscopic surgery, hopefully uh, will do wonders for, for the ergonomics of, of a surgeon's body. It's crazy. And then, so like on top of that, you know, how do you deal with situations that don't necessarily go well? You know, you spend eight hours on a surgery and that person maybe doesn't end up um, turning out very well. You know, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I think, I think that's sort of the more, um, I think that's sort of the darker side of medicine, right? That's the part that we all try to try to brush under the mental rug and, and, and try to forget about. But I think it's important for us to, to emphasize those moments and to grow from them and learn from them. There is a very good book. Um, uh, there's two really good books. One is called Do No Harm by Henry Marsh. Um, and that is uh, about a neurosurgeon in the UK who talks about sort of a lot of his patient cases and sort of the way he both mentally and psychologically deals with these stressors of having very challenging patients in difficult cases. Um, and then of course, Atul Gawande has, has a lot of amazing research and books about um, how, to, how to approach end of life and, and as a physician as well from, from the healthcare perspective. Uh, I think it's very challenging. I think the first time I lost a patient was very hard. It was very emotionally hard and doesn't get any easier but I think you build coping mechanisms. And I think it's very important to build good coping mechanisms and positive coping, coping mechanisms as opposed to negative ones. A lot of times um, uh, we'll see people in medicine, not just surgery, obviously, but in medicine who are angry and, um, and sort of very short. And, uh, and I think there's a common misconception that these are just you know, bad people or angry people. But I think these, a lot of times these are people who are struggling to, to cope with, with this dark side of medicine that, you know, we take care of sick patients all day and there's a lot of loss of human life. And I think that's, that's uh, very important to, uh, to shine a light on that.
Emma, we've gotten several people asking this question. So how do you feel that your family and work-life balance is? Do you have control over it at all? Um, it's, uh, you know, I think there, there are rotations where you have more control than others. My, I would say I'm a little bit of, a, of, a, of an exception, partially, I would say yes or no, actually. All my family's international. My parents are in Palestine. My siblings are in London. A lot of my friends are international because I went to international schools and I went to international medical school. So I don't, I don't have sort of one city I call home or one place I can go to and see everyone. So I never have a great, uh, you know, work, work life balance from a family and friends perspective. But then again, almost everyone in residency has moved to a different city, to go to residency. So a lot of people are also away from home from that perspective. Uh, I think it's, it's very challenging. You don't have that much control of your life. You get to sort of request vacations. You only get three to four weeks a year, depending on the specialty you're in. Surgery, you only get three weeks a year. Um, you don't really get to choose the weekends you're off. And so I've missed a lot of weddings. I've missed a lot of birthdays. Uh, you know, I was kind of single birthday with any of my family members or a single one of my birthdays with my family members. I haven't spent almost any holidays with my family members in the past almost decade. Um, and that's just a reality of, of, I think, not just surgery, but medicine is, is like going back to what we talked about earlier. There's a lot of sacrifice involved, unfortunately. I think that does get a little bit better. And uh, you might be able to, to comment on that a little bit more since you've been practicing for 40 years. But I think once you get into practice, you probably have a little bit more control and you probably have a little bit more time for work-life balance. But I think in training, uh, all bets are off and you really are there to get as much experience as possible. And you're there to take care of patients. And that's your sort of number one goal. And uh, unfortunately that doesn't leave a lot of time for work-life balance. And hey, so like you're saying that your training, you're saying that your training is far more focused on getting the information and experience into your head and much, much less focused on work-life balance and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, w I, w I would definitely agree with that statement. I, I have, there's a very, um, very good plastic surgeon here at Harvard. His name is Dr. Don Morris. And he told me, and I sort of, you know, couldn't put these words as, as well as he did for the past five years, but he sort of really solidified it in my mind. He said, you are the chairman of your own education. No one is going to learn the information for you. No one's going to get the experience for you. No one's going to put the hours for you. If what you want to do is go through training and just check off the boxes and get all the appropriate case numbers you need to graduate, you can do that. Um, but if you really want to want to get the most out of it, and if you really, really want to be able to say that you're the best of the best and, and get the best technical experience, then you have to put in those extra hours. You have to really delve into the subject and the study and the focus um, that it requires. And I think that's, that's probably the, the most important thing I've ever heard is that you are the chairman of your own education, meaning you decide your own future. So you're saying there really is that much information. It's not some easy thing that it really takes years of study and experience to get there. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish, right? Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, pimp, I'm pimping you on that question, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's so, it's so crazy. I, and I think there is, there, there's a term for this. And if anyone in the audience knows it, please, please write it down. It's those who don't know that much about a topic will feel like they know a lot. And those who know a lot about a topic will feel like they don't know anything. And when I first joined surgery, there you go, Dunning-Kruger effect. I love it. Oh my God, we have so many smart people. When I first joined surgery, I was like, oh yeah, I read this like quick textbook on surgery. I know everything. And you know, a few years later, I'm like, I'm pulling on my hair. I don't know anything. I've done this for five years and I still don't, don't know anything. And I think that's so true in medicine. And, uh, you know, going back to another uh, surgeon I was speaking to the other day, actually, uh, Dr. Mulliken, he is a, he's one of the, the founders of plastic surgery. He is probably one of the most profound cleft lip surgeon in the world. One of the most famous ones. He's about 82 years old, uh, 82 years old now. He's still working, he's still operating at Boston Children's Hospital and the number one uh, hospital, children's hospital in the country. And he said this the other day, he told me, Amor, I'm still learning. Um, he's 82 years old and he's still learning. I mean, m medicine is a lifelong commitment. It truly is a lifestyle. Um, and you have to have a passion for learning. You have to have a passion for education. I think that never stops. Amor, I, I read all the time. I probably read four hours a day, maybe more. 
uh, and I don't even have a smartphone. You know, I uh, is in my field, emergency medicine, we see the emergent aspects of everything from toenails to scalp, uh, age, gender, all languages. I'm frequently doing an H and P in Mandarin, you know, and um, and experience has a great deal to do with number one, being honest about what you don't know. Uh, and then number two is that the risk, I tell my, I'll shut up with this, Taylor. Uh, I tell, we have a, we have a robust CQI, you know, QA committee, quality assurance committee for the ER. And I say, you do not want to be on the agenda of that committee because somebody got hurt and they are talking about you. Anyway, yeah. that's last thought. That's all. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Um, I think, I think we got to here, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. So we talked a little bit about acute care surgery. Let's talk about this case, case in, in acute care surgery, right? We have a 40, sorry, 54 year old male. He comes to the ED with sudden onset, severe abdominal pain, nausea. These are his vitals. His blood pressure is 90 over 40. That's kind of low. He's hypotensive. His heart rate's 133. That's high. He's tachycardic. His temperature, this is, you know, uh, the metric system. So 38.9, it's high, he's febrile. And he's uh, saturating 92% uh, his blood oxygen on two liters nasal cannula. That's, you know, abnormal for someone who's walking off the street, right? His past medical histories, he's, he says he only has heartburn. Past surgical history, none. Medications, only on omeprazole. That sort of medication to treat heartburn you can take once or twice a day. He's got no, no known allergies. Then you do your exam, he looks kind of pale. He's hunched over in pain. He's peritoneal on exam, meaning he's in extreme pain every time you touch his abdomen. This sort of is a telltale sign of that there's an intra-abdominal process going on, or what we call a surgical abdomen, an acute abdomen. And he's mainly peritoneal in the epigastric region or the right upper quadrant. His abdomen is distended. You get imaging and he's got CT scan of pneumoperitoneum, meaning he's got air outside of his intestines where it's not supposed to be. And he's got some stranding around the duodenum. That's just a fancy word for inflammation. Things look a little bit different on, on a CAT scan, on a CT scan when you have inflammation. And I see a lot of people throwing some awesome, awesome comments and, and taking good guesses in the, in the chat box there, a few of you are right. A few of you can also be right based off this. Uh, so this, this could actually present in multiple, you know, that's, that's a beauty of surgery. Um, this can, this can, you know, the straining in, in, in the, in the duodenum can be just a red herring. It can be a reactive straining because of fecal matter in the abdomen, right? Or it could be straining because that's where the problem is. Um, he could just have stranding in general because he's got, you know, some type of duodenitis that's unrelated. Um, so, so that's, that's, that's the beauty of surgery is that despite this, you know, you, you could probably guess 90% what the problem is, but even the best surgeon will off, often get this wrong because you can go in and you can be shocked. The problem can be somewhere else. This here is a CAT scan. For those of you that don't know, this is sort of a, slice of a of, of, of your body. This here is the front of your body. This here is the back of your body. This is your spine. This is your right side. This is your left side. So if you're looking at this, your head is sort of inside the monitor. Your feet are all the way out here. And this is going up and down. And it gives you a really nice shot into, into, into the human body. And here you can see this is the liver, this sort of a, a paler uh, organ. These two things here are the kidneys. This is the aorta, full of contrast. These are your ribs out here, those white, very white spots. And everything that's black is air. So this here is your stomach. And there's some air in the stomach, that's great. This here is your descending colon. There's some air with some stool in there, that's great. But there's, there's this black dot here. And there's all this black stuff up here. And all this is air that's outside the intestines that shouldn't be there. And this is what we call pneumoperitoneum. This is a surgical emergency. And you got to get to the operating room and figure out what the problem is. 
this here is the duodenum. It's hard to see, but this sort of there's a tube coming down here. This is the second portion of the duodenum. And here you can see all the stranding. This is what we call stranding around it. So this is all some inflammation around the duodenum, giving you again, you know, a sign of what's going on. This here, this is the arrow sign. <laughs> Anytime a radiologist points an arrow to something, then you know there's a problem. But um, this here is, is, is what we call free fluid in the abdomen. And you can see it sort of takes the shape of the abdomen here. That's just free fluid, meaning where is this coming from? Um, it could be normal amounts, trace free fluid in, a, in the pelvis of a woman of childbearing age, totally normal. Uh, free fluid after a gunshot wound, not normal. Free fluid with someone who's got peritonitis, very not normal. So all these are very telltale signs that there's something going on. Treatment. So although um, we're surgeons and we got to think about getting to the operating room, treatment should start as soon as possible. He's hypertensive. You want to give him some fluids. You're suspecting an intra-abdominal perforation. You want to give him some IV antibiotics. He's got some duodenal straining. You're suspecting that this might be ulcer related. Start him on some IV proton pump inhibitor therapy that blocks the proton pumps in your, um, in your stomach from releasing acid and worsening a problem. And then get to the operating room as quickly as possible for an exploratory laparotomy. That's just a fancy term of saying, open up his abdomen. What antibiotics will you use uh, across the board? Zosin and something? Yeah, we typically use vanxosin, anything for, um, for gut. So anything esophageal or gastric in nature, even sometimes duodenal uh, will add some um, uh, fungal coverage, fluconazole, um, as the foregut is colonized with fungal elements. But not um, flagell routinely? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think flagell is definitely um, another one that you could use. I think you get some of the uh, anaerobic coverage with zosin. Um, but you could definitely use, you know, ceftriaxone flagell is, is another great one, covers all the gram negatives, ceftriaxone, all the anaerobics flagell. Um, so that's, that's, that's another good one to use for intra-abdominal processes. And here we go. So apologies for the, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to sometimes um, see what's going on. But probably the most important thing to learn is the anatomy is never like in the textbooks, um, meaning it's not beautiful. It's not colored. You know, the arteries aren't red, the veins aren't blue. Um, it's sort of, you know, always looks like this and you're like, Oh, what's going on? Well, this here is the left lobe of the liver. That's the right lobe of the liver. And you're just looking down this here is a stomach. And this here looks like the pylorus. And this here is the duodenum. And this is here is a, a clamp. It looks like a coke clamp of some sorts. And all, all they're doing is they're pointing it at a hole here. And this is a hole in the duodenum. So this is perforated duodenal ulcer, meaning the patient had an ulcer, it perforated, spilled all this content, sorry again, spilled all this intra-abdominal content, and now he is uh, you know, in septic shock because of this. So how do you repair this? Really cool thing called the Graham patch, uh, first described by Dr. Graham. Um, what they, what they noted is these patients, by the time they showed up, by the time they got pain, they showed up, it was several hours later, and the inflammation was so bad that if you just tried to yank the edges of the, of the, of the intestine together, the sutures would rip through that inflamed tissue. And so instead of trying to do that, we took, we realized that if you take a tongue of vascularized omentum and you sort of put it over that area and you just tie those sutures over the omentum, that tended to seal the hole and then the body would heal the hole on its own and now what you've done is you've sealed the hole so things can't escape. The body's going to heal the hole. Uh, and then you clean, wash out the abdomen, close them up, leave a couple of drains in there just to drain as much as you can. And that, that pretty much takes care of the problem. Um, I remember when you talked about putting the stitches through rotten tissue, we used to call that in the old days, sewing moonbeams to flayed us. <laughs> that sounds like a good description <laughs> of what I've seen. <laughs> yeah, these, 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 these things will never hold. Um, uh, but, you know, there's ulcer surgery is way more complicated than this. Obviously, uh, there's acute and chronic ulcer surgery it can become very, very complicated. But this is sort of the general, the easiest case you get is hopefully one of these things. It's interesting, uh, Amar, that is actually what took my mother's life. She was 93. She was taking NSAIDs, nap uh, naproxen specifically, perf to do an anal ulcer, uh, sepsis peritonitis at the age of 93, and she passed away. That oh. very case. and so. 
these things can be absolutely deadly, as you know. I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it's one of those things. Yeah. Well, thank All you. Right. Please, please, um, move, please move on. Let's talk about hepatobiliary surgery. Like I said, it's actually called HPB, hepatio, hepatobiliary pancreatico surgery. And that is the surgery of the liver, the gallbladder, the pancreas, and a lot of times it involves a few other things like the spleen, um, like some shunting in that area. Uh, uh, so it can be a little bit more, more diverse. Uh, this generally does not cover transplants. Transplant is sort of its own field, just because it's they're they're two such large beasts. These two fields that they that they ended up splitting up. This mainly covers oncologic issues involving the liver and gallbladder and pancreas. Um, usually, these patients you see them in clinic, not so much in the emergency department because they have tumors. They have other problems that are chronic in nature for the most part. They're usually worked up in a multidisciplinary setting, meaning you have uh, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, geneticists, all working to work these patients up. Sometimes the GI team as well, the gastroenterology team from the medicine perspective, helping you with diagnostics and sometimes therapeutics. So this is very much a collaborative field. And uh, the, 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 main, the mainstay of surgery so the mainstay of treatment from a surgical perspective for these patients is obviously resection, and you're ultimately hoping for a cure. Um, unfortunately, the field of HPB, uh, the cures are, are not as common because the, the cancers are pretty aggressive and the diagnosis is often late, uh, but we have made some tremendous progress over the past, past decades and improved um, surgical outcomes and five-year mortality rates in, 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 the, in, these, in these fields. This is another case study here. Let's talk about a 49 year old female with worsening abdominal pain over the course of six to 12 months that has uh, an increasing abdominal girth, just meaning she's you know, getting, her abdomen is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, she presents to your clinic with the following findings on a CAT scan. You know, Obviously she came into the CAT scan, meaning she probably saw someone, that someone, usually a PCP or sometimes the emer emergency room got a CAT scan, they found a problem and they sent them to you. And you see this on the CAT scan. So like we talked about front side of the body, back side of the body, right, left, this is a liver here. And you can see this massive thing, oh, massive right. thing here in the liver. Clearly something oh, going on, yeah. right? Um, and then uh, we diagnosed her with a hepatic adenoma and adenoma is an abnormal growth in the liver. There are different types of hepatic tumors. Adenomas tend to be uh, non-malignant in nature, but they have a propensity, especially when they're larger, to progress to, mal to malignancy, or sometimes they can even rupture and bleed, um, and that can cause hemorrhagic shock. So the majority of these patients will get this resected unless it's under a certain size requirement or it's pretty stable over the course of several years. But something like this, you will get it resected. So we went to the operating room. This is me and Dr. Young at the University of Washington. He's one of the most senior HPB surgeons there, amazing surgeon. And this is the size of a tumor in an otherwise young, healthy woman. I mean, this thing was just sitting in her liver for years and years. What do you think caused that? Environmental exposure? Um, there, there is, there's some literature on or, um, uh, oral contraceptives that, that will, that will cause these. I think a lot of times that is actually, uh, uh, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg, or are they just causing them to get larger or are they really causing them to form de novo? Um, I think it's definitely multifactorial. Uh, there are a lot of genetic components to it. There are a lot of genes like beta catenin that they're found to be associated with worse outcomes with these tumors. And, um, I think in, 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 in general, most people uh, will say that they're just sort of multifactorial in nature, uh, but certainly over the counter, over the, sorry, oral contraceptive pills and certain medications will cause these things to grow. Uh, and which is why we end up resecting them. In my world in the ER, uh, especially with so much hepatitis C that we see, we see so much hepatocellular carcinoma. And so to have a benign tumor that you pull out that's the size of a, what, soccer ball almost, uh, that's a, a blessed thing for that patient. I bet the patient could finally start eating a full meal again because they didn't feel so full. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Let's talk a little bit about the last field I'm going to go through, which is trauma surgery. Probably if I didn't become a plastic surgeon, I would become a trauma surgeon just because I fell in love with trauma surgery so much. Um, it is the exact opposite of plastic surgery. That's, that's the funny thing, which just, you know, proves that I don't think it's a personality that drives someone to a certain, certain field. It's their experience and their love for that, uh, for the patient population and anatomy and such. Um, I was very fortunate enough, obviously, to be at the University of Washington. Uh, Harborview Medical Center is one of the centers that we train at extensively. I think I spent a total of, you know, probably three years total at Harborview Medical Center, level one trauma center. Mainly, we took care of uh, blunt and penetrating trauma patients. Um, a lot of times, these patients are uh, triaged by two different, you know, mechanisms. One is, you know, full trauma or modified trauma. These can have different names and in different institutions. It can be major trauma, minor trauma. You know, these, these, these terms aren't, aren't, aren't set in stone, but they're there for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they uh, make the entire team aware of the urgency of the issue and the emergency of the issue. And two, they get all the appropriate resources uh, to where you need them really fast. I mean, for full trauma teams, you have the emergency doctor attending, emergency doctor, chief resident, all the emergency uh, uh, medicine uh, residents who are, uh, you know, first or second year. You have the general, or they have the trauma surgeon. You have the trauma surgery fellow. You have the trauma surgery chief. You have the anesthesia attending, the anesthesia resident. You have three or four uh, incredible trauma nurses who have been there for 20, 30 years. You have the blood bank, you have the ABG, you have the ABG card. Um, and that's just, you know, a portion of the people that show up to these insane trauma codes. Because here, unlike in acute care surgery where you have hours to figure out the problem and save life, here a lot of times you have seconds, literally seconds or minutes to figure out the problem and find a solution. Um, which is why you really have to be at the top of your game uh, and, and why these things are so emergent in nature. Uh, unfortunately, that means there's a lot of waiting. This is one of my co-chief residents from last year, uh, Vimukta Mahadev, who's now a trauma. Uh, he, was, he actually ended up staying at Harborview Medical Center doing his trauma fellowship there. He loved it so much. And now he's at trauma attending. Um, Mate, mate in three, I love it. <laughs> uh, but you don't, you're just sort of waiting. You're, you're just sort of just sitting and waiting around, waiting for your pager to go off. There's a lot of small things you take care of. Not every trauma is big, obviously. A lot of things you can walk towards, but some things you really have to run towards. Um, and this is, this was one of those things. I was on trauma call. This is Christmas Eve, literally December 24th, I think 2018. Um, when I got full, four full trauma codes within eight minutes, one gunshot to the neck, three multiple stab wounds to the chest and neck, 22 hours down into my shift, eight hours to go, 3.12 in the morning. Um, this was, I think it was a guy who uh, got pissed off at his roommates, um, shot one of them, stabbed three others, or maybe, I think, I think he stabbed three others and then maybe shot himself in the neck. Or, or something of that nature. And, you know, all these four people, full trauma codes, three in the morning, you're exhausted. Um, they all come in at once. All of a sudden you go from this massive team to almost, you know, this is a mass casualty uh, where you really, the most important thing here, the most important thing is uh, communication, dividing up your resources and triaging who's the most acute, who's the least acute, who's gonna die in a few minutes, seconds, who's gonna die in a few minutes, who's gonna make it through the night and can wait. Um, this is what the end of a trauma code will often look like. I think these are my shoes over here. Um, this was you know, I have a picture at Parkland similar to this where we took the whole room and every single thing, everything in that picture you're showing was a moment to try to save a life, some effort to save a life. Yeah, that is, that is so true. It is, it is, I, I, I think trauma surgery is sort of, a lot of people will say it's, um, you know, it's very rough and tough and uh, it's not finesse. I completely disagree. I think trauma surgery is the pinnacle of medicine, 
not only from a, a time perspective, you have seconds or minutes, but also the amount of coordination and teamwork and, and communication it takes to save a life, as you can see here, you are doing everything you can using the most amazing technology, the most you know accurate diagnostics uh, that you have at hand within those few seconds to make that diagnosis and try to save a life. I think it really exemplifies modern medicine and the importance of teamwork and an organized structural response to a critical patient in order to try to save a life. Let's talk about a quick case in trauma surgery. 28 year old male, gunshot wound to the face. He got criked in the field. That's a fancy way to say cricothyroidotomy, meaning, um, you know, again, as we talked about, our, our EMS team is so amazing in the field here that they're comfortable enough doing crikes where they put a tube um, into the neck, straight into the airway. Um, a lot of times it's because they can't get an oral airway in, uh, an oral endotracheal tube or any, any other type of tube. Um, here, clearly it was probably because he, there was a gunshot wound to the face. And usually this presents in way, itself in two ways. I'm usually either hanging out down in the emergency department um, just because all my friends are down there, my colleagues are down there, we're having fun, waiting for things to happen. And then you hear overhead, uh, 28 year old male gunshot wound to the face, crike in the field, arriving ETA three minutes, full trauma team activation. Or you're off somewhere doing something and all you get is a page that says full trauma team activation, um, tells you the room that you're supposed to go to in the emergency room and you're just running there. And so on arrival, this guy, obviously we consider this an unstable airway. An unstable airway is the scariest thing in medicine. Uh, as a note, I should say that trauma surgeons are probably the most, um, the calmest and the most self-composed surgeons I've met in my career uh, for the most part. But there's only one thing that would make a trauma surgeon really, really scared. And that's when you can't get an airway. And that didn't sort of, first I was like, why are you so scared? Just get an airway. But then I realized it's because it's such an acute problem and it's such a difficult problem to solve. And a lot of times it's why patients unfortunately die. Um, it's because you can't get an airway. And so this is a really, really scary, scary thing when you have an unstable airway. Fortunately, and for, this the student, has for the students here, for the students here, what uh, Amara had to do was take him to the operating room to go through the neck to get an airway because you couldn't get to the airway through the mouth. Exactly. And then imagine, imagine holding your breath and not being able to breathe. Now, that's how long you have before the patient dies, right? So um, luckily this patient came into the crike, so they're somewhat getting some oxygen in, but they had, a, they had their whole face blown up. They're still sad and well. But one more you know, thing to keep it interesting, this was last year in February, patient was COVID-19 positive. Um, and so, you know, we still gotta do what you gotta do. We crashed into the emergency room uh, for a tracheostomy, uh, meaning converting this unstable airway into a stable airway. They're both going through the neck, but one is stable, meaning it's reliable. Um, and we actually ended up being the first uh, team in the United States to perform an operation on a COVID positive patient. Uh, as you know, Seattle was the first hit city in the US. Um, and uh, we implemented um, an amazing response to COVID patients where uh, even though this was the first time we did it, this actual picture here showing the first surgery that we ever did on a COVID positive patient, it was so smooth um, and it worked so well. And that's because everything was set up beforehand. The system that a level one trauma center works with is so complex and so intricate and the details are so fine that they're able to take this unknown and convert it into sort of a reliable outcome. Very, very proud of Harvard um, for, uh, for their- Yeah, Amar, let me, let me comment on this. Uh, Seattle was ground zero for COVID in America. It's where it showed up first. And at this particular picture, these folks have taken care of a patient with a disease that this, the medical staff here did not know if this was sufficient protection to keep them from dying of that problem. And in spite of that, they took care of the patient anyway. Uh, were you scared a little bit, uh, Amr, that uh, it might not be enough? Yeah, you know, I think, 
I, th- I think back then people were talking about a mortality rate, a mortality rate of 10%, you know, just because, you know, I think the, the diagnosis was still, um, you know, the actual prevalence was unknown. And so the mortality rate showed up really high and, and it was scary. And, and if you think about where COVID lives, I mean, it lives in the airway. And here we are rushing this person to the OR who has a problem with his airway. And we're trying to operate on the airway on a COVID positive patient in something that we'd never done before, the country hadn't done before. And so definitely a scary moment. Um, but, you know, I think that's just, you know, where the adrenaline kicks in, you just, you just got to do what you got to do. And I think it's important to note that this looks like a nice, clean, quiet room because there's only five of us in here. This was truly just, you know, I was a chief resident on trauma surgery. This is a circulating nurse, meaning she's grabbing everything for the operating nurse or the scrub tech. This is the anesthesia attending, and this is a trauma surgeon right here. And usually there's at least double or triple the amount of people in the room. And here we had the bone essentials, like the minimum, you had the minimal amount of people necessary to do this operation um, is what we were allowed. Um, But fortunately, knock on wood, it went well, the patient did fine uh, and they survived. Amara, on behalf of the whole group and all 300 that are hanging on every word, you are a hero and your team are heroes. So oh, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Everybody put a thank you, uh, Dr. Nasser, uh, into chat and thank him for his service. Uh, this was absolutely amazing. And uh, we are honored that you would share this with us. Absolutely. And it's just honestly just another day of the job. Um, <laughs> yeah. This is... This is this so this is this is all I have for today. I'm obviously happy to answer any more questions. Uh, we can do another Q and A, and I think we have a quiz to get to after that. Okay, yeah. So I guess uh, something that I was seeing in the questions is so how do you prepare yourself for any kind of situation? You know, you don't. Sometimes it's your first time dealing with that case. Are you just kind of relying on the teamwork effort of somebody knowing what's like how to do it, or do you just go off what you learned? You know. Um. You know, I think it definitely depends on the case and the acuity of the situation. You know, if it's a scheduled case, then you have a lot of time to prep for it. You have a lot of time to read about that patient, learn who they are, learn the anatomy, learn the operation, learn the techniques. And that comes from inside. You have to have the drive to get home at night and open the books after, you know, a 12 to 14 hour day, you got to get home and you got to study even as a doctor, even as a surgeon. Um, and that, that's, that's the importance of continuing your education. And I think, you know, the first time I did a gallbladder, for example, um, I had nothing, I didn't know anything about it, but then the hundredth time I did it, you know, the reading becomes a little bit less and less, and you're just maybe fine tuning a few points. Uh, this is a training program as well. So there's always someone there. If I'm an intern or I'm, I'm a second year or third year, there's always someone higher than me, a fourth year, a fifth year, uh, and ultimately an attending that I can always reach out to and ask for questions and ask for their help. And we're always under the supervision of attendings, which is great. Um, and ultimately that's probably the best source of, 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 of education. But you really have to um, go in there and know your, know your theory at least. Because if you don't know your theory, it's very hard to build uh, experience on top of that. Having said that, I don't think you can learn surgery or any field in medicine out of a book. I think there's a common uh, saying, uh, I'm probably going to completely butcher it, but um, it's it's something about, you know, you could study the sea or or study sailing all you want, but um, if you've never been out to sea and you've never sailed, then you're not truly uh, a sailor. Um, And truly being out there on the water, um, pulling the ropes and lifting the sails uh, is probably the best way to learn but you really have to have the fundamental knowledge and the theory behind it all. The way I heard that was um, uh, he who sails without a map sails an uncharted sea, but he who studies maps alone has never been to sea at all. There you go. I love <laughs> Something it. Something like that. <laughs> hey, hey Amr, uh, Amr, by the way, uh, you need to come down to Dallas. We'll get you some gallstones down here, son. <laughs> I'd love to. We are Texas is the gallstone capital of the world. It has to do with genetics and uh, especially in our Hispanic population. We see every complication of biliary tract disease down here. Oh wow. Oh yeah. Okay, so I'd I guess, love to come um, over and visit. 
something that I was going to say. So what tips would you recommend for people who are interested in surgery or just interested in medicine, or I guess maybe something you wish you would have started earlier or just known before? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably an entire talk on its own, really <laughs> um, trying to prep people for uh, getting to where they want to get to. Um, you know, I think, I think there is, there's a part of me that loves this notion, a part of me that hates this notion um, of what I'm gonna, what I'm about to say next, is that the earlier you start or decide on your career, the more time you have to buff up your CV and get there. Because a lot of times it's about CV, right? Like you're matching into a medical school or you're matching into a residency or a fellowship. A lot of it is about your CV. Um, and if you know that you wanna go into medicine since you're four years old, then you can probably work on that over the course of your entire life to build up your CV. If you know you want to go to surgery from your first year of medical school, you can spend your second year, third year, fourth year of medical school working on that. You can do research. You can get to know everyone. The part of me that doesn't like that notion is that you're deciding early on before you even have the opportunity to rotate on all the services. And that's the, that's, those are sort of the advantages and, 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 and the disadvantages of deciding early. The advantage is you get to really like focus on this field, learn as much as you can, do research, do extracurricular activities, join all these societies, go to all these meetings, face-to-face -face with people, and hopefully that'll improve your application. The downside is you're sort of ignoring all the rest of medicine, which is so beautiful. Um, and it actually is so useful. There's so much I learn. Uh, so much I do on a daily basis, even now as a plastic surgery fellow that I learned in medical school or I learned on a rotation doing, you know, random X, Y, and Z um, because it's so important to be a well-rounded physician and not just be a super specialist at the end of the day. Um, but if, if, if you know what you want to do and you are just, you know, you know, completely, uh, completely focused on becoming a nephrologist or completely focused on becoming, you know, an emergency physician or a specific type of surgeon, especially if it's a surgical subspecialty because they're very competitive, um, then you should, as early as possible, get into research. And what does that mean? That means look up um, in your medical school or in your, if you're still in pre-med, who is the most productive researcher in the field in your medical school? Literally see who is publishing the most, who gives the most talks, do a quick PubMed review on them, find, find out who they are and email them, cold email them, no problem. Email these people, go up, knock on the door. A lot of times people in medicine are very happy to help and they're very happy to have extra help. Um, help them out with research, get to know the topic, get to, get to know the subject, publish as much as you can. That will not only cement your knowledge about that field, but also prepare you academically and prepare your resume for uh, applications into residency or, you know, fellowship or, or whatever it is that you're hoping to get into. That's awesome. I'm guessing that's how you got your 15 publications. You just reached out to people and were bold. Yeah, I, I that, that is, you know, uh, one of my good family friends once told me, um, it's great to make friends and get to know the waiters, but you should also not be afraid to go speak to the owner of the restaurant. And what that means is, um, you know, if you want to do research and you're just going to the residents and being, hey, can you help me, in our, you know, can I do a research project with you? The residents are so busy and sometimes they're not even the people who are publishing that much. Um, just go straight to the top. And, and that's what I did. I went to Dr. Uh, Rich Hopper, who's um, the director of the Craniofacial uh, uh, and Plastic Surgery Center at Seattle Children's Hospital. He's a plastic surgeon. He's a craniofacial uh, pediatric surgeon. And I told him, I was like, I'm interested in plastic surgery. Um, I, 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 I want to, you know, I love craniofacial. This is what I want to do. I want to work with you. And he's like, he was so kind, has been a great mentor for four or five years now, um, took me under his wing and, and helped me uh, uh, a lot. And then I ended up doing a lot of research with him. And that was, that was a great time. That's awesome. And so I, I'm assuming you kind of had an interest in surgery because you said you like psychiatry. So you just kind of navigated through instead of picking one route at the beginning or? Uh, yeah, I was exactly like that. I actually didn't make up my mind until really late, even later than that. I initially liked, you know, I found psychiatry really interesting. I found, I found neurology really interesting. Um, I love Dr. House. So I thought nephrology and infectious disease, which are his two subspecialties were very interesting. 
And then ultimately I thought I wanted to become a cardiologist. So I came to uh, Harvard, did a rotation in cardiology here. That was in my last year. That was three months before graduating. And then my last two months before graduating were surgery uh, clerkships. And that's when I really fell in love with surgery. And so for, for me, it was up to the last day, um, meaning it's never too late. Uh, but I think the way things are progressing and the, the applicants we're getting, the, you know, every year now are just so impressive. I would never get into surgery right now. I mean, it's only been like five years, but people are just so impressive in the field right now. So I think the more you have on your CV, the more you have on your resume and the more you've sort of delved into the topic, I think it definitely helps you. Uh, now. Isn't, isn't it interesting, Amr, that you uh, really only decided what your profession was going to be, surgery, really late in the game. And I remember in my third year in med school that every rotation I went on to where they were really nice to me, that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. I think, and I, I think that is sort of very natural for us to be drawn towards great mentors. And I, I think that ultimately a lot of it is your personality and what you're interested in. But if you really break it down, what you're interested in is what uh, people help you become interested in. And what people help you become interested in are those who uh, have a way of um, exemplifying their field. And those, by definition, are great mentors. And I think that's why mentorship is so important um, in the field of medicine, um, uh, which is also why I'm, I'm trying to you know, mentor as many people as possible. I'm trying to give as much advice and guidance as possible. I've opened up my um, Instagram to having people uh, text me. I get um, uh, messages from all over the world. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions about that. I'm happy to, uh, help guide any people at all. Um, I think I have my, my Instagram here. So if anyone ever needs anything, just text me on there or think, uh, what's the term, um, direct message me on there. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer any questions. I'm, I'm happy to give any advice that I, that I can, because I think it's so crucial to have good mentors, uh, in, in the field of medicine. That's great. Dr. Fowler, do you have any like closing questions for him? Yeah. Um, gosh, Amber, what a wonderful talk. We are deeply honored for you to join us. This means a great deal to us. You had 320 pre-healthcare folks sitting on the edge of their chairs, just loving what you had to say. Your, your style of speaking is just so relaxed and so comforting. You're so honest. It, it was really fascinating to hear and all the students pay attention to what he said a few minutes ago, which was the surgery career was fairly late to appeal to him. He didn't go in there knowing what he wanted to do. That's, that's perfectly fine. I did a year of surgery, Amr, <clears throat> decided it just wasn't for me. And so I dropped out in 1978 and started working emergency medicine full time. And it's been 44 years. I fortunately backed into a career that turned out to be something that I made a lifetime out of. So Everybody is going to be different. Don't be afraid. You will find your job. Uh, an important question about burnout came up out uh, a few minutes ago, which had to do with, you know, more and more physicians being burned out. And I, I, I think that the symptom of that is people at least not knowing that they wanted to be taking care of people through learning and applied science. And I think that that's a very critical aspect. Um, Amor, if I may, I'm going to, this is for everybody who's still listening, uh, all 300 of you. We're going to be rolling out a new program called Advanced Mental Health Life Support this coming Monday at one o'clock central time. Um, it is a four hour program that's free. I'm putting the link to it in chat right now that you can sign up to register. And why don't you join us? It is a new course designed to help recognize and manage excited delirium in the field, including appropriate positioning of the patient. We saw what happened in the terrible George Floyd thing where prone positioning and with a knee in the back kills people. And so we're gonna address all those things. You're more than welcome to come. And uh, uh, the link to it is in chat. All you have to do is sign up. We have 300 seats available. Uh, I think about 50 are taken. So you're more than welcome to join us. <clears throat> 
Amra, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you all who were with us this evening, your wonderful students. Um, as we've said, if you keep coming back on virtual shadowing, we're going to be here for you. So, um, and let's see, uh, Taylor, do you have a link uh, for the exam for this evening? Uh, it's on the next slide, I believe. And so this is for assessment 60. It's gonna be due next Wednesday at 6.59 p.m. right before the next session. And so just be sure to get, um, get to that sometime before then. You have two attempts to get at least a 70 so you can get your certificate. And that's it. And, and, and Emma, I will say in closing that you said something really important. When you go to the restaurant, not only get to know the waiters and servers, but get to know the, uh, get to know the uh, owner of the restaurant as well. But, but I would also add, get to know your bartender really well, you know, be on, on a first name <laughs> basis. And several members of the working group and I will be in the bar. It's a very civilized thing is that the faculty club at UT Southwestern turns into a bar at four o'clock. Melvin is the bartender. And so we will be having a Melvin moment on Thursday afternoon. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Amr, again, I can't thank you enough. And on behalf of the whole working group for virtual shadowing, uh, everybody pop one last thank you, Dr. Nasser, into, into <laughs> chat for just thanking one last time. Amber, take a look at chat. Let's have about 200 thank yous come through. <laughs> oh my God. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Fowler. Right? Thank you so much, Taylor, for, uh, for organizing. Guys, I really, really uh, enjoyed this. It's been an honor to speak here and I'm really looking forward to next month where I'll, where I'll be able to talk a little bit about plastic surgery. We cannot wait. And on behalf of the whole team, we wish you a good evening and a good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye.